Señor Presidente. Mr. President. Mr. Secretary General. I express our recognition for your notable efforts during your mandate. Heads of state and government, distinguished delegates. Statistics could not be more eloquent. 80% of the world's population owns only 6% of all the wealth. While the one, the wealthiest 1% enjoys half of the planet's patrimony. No less than 795 million persons in the world suffer from chronic hunger, and every day 18,000 children die due to poverty. More than 660 million persons consume unsafe water, and 780 million adults and 103 million youths are illiterate. It is quite likely that they have never heard of the Millennium Development Goals. But if they had, they would hardly believe in the new Sustainable Development Goals. The gap between our deliberations and people's realities persists. The lack of political will on the part of industrialized states becomes evident. The irrational patterns of consumption and production of capitalism, which lead to the destruction of living conditions in the planet, are replicated. The huge nuclear and conventional stockpiles and the annual military expenditures of $1.7 trillion contradict those who affirm that there are no resources to eradicate poverty and underdevelopment. However, there are many arguments that justify the urgency of building a new international financial architecture. In developed countries, Welfare societies are disappearing. Political systems are in crisis. Pockets of poverty are expanding. Brutal neoliberal adjustment programs are used against workers, youths, and migrants. And dark neo-fascist forces are dangerously developing. The philosophy of plunder supports the military interventions and non-conventional wars launched by NATO member countries against sovereign states for the purpose of changing governments and taking over their natural resources. The imposition of unilateral coercive measures, the use of financial, judicial, cultural, and propaganda tools to destabilize governments the militarization and aggressive use of cyberspace and the violation of the human rights of hundreds of millions of persons have become a regular feature. The waves of refugees heading for Europe, driven by underdevelopment as well as NATO interventions, are evidence of the cruelty, oppressive nature, inefficiency and unsustainability of the current international order. A solution based on respect for human rights and the dignity of persons aimed at eradicating the root causes of the problem is still not in sight. The year 2015 was also the worst one in terms of climate change. For the world has witnessed a rise in global temperatures, the melting of the ice caps, the rise in sea levels, and an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. In these circumstances, we reiterate our solidarity with the small island developing states, particularly in the Caribbean, which are the most deeply affected by climate change and for which we demand a fair, special, and differentiated treatment. 
while we all expect to see some progress in the fulfillment by industrialized countries of the obligations entered into under the ambiguous Paris Agreement, only tangible data in the area of financing and transfers of technology to developing countries could rekindle any hope for the survival of the human species. Capitalism, however, will never be historically or environmentally sustainable. Mr. President, peace and development are the raison d'etre of the United Nations organization. The creation of a culture of peace and justice as the basis of a new international order is an urgent and imperative need for the human species. Any attempt to prolong the existence of a unipolar world through war, domination, or hegemony would be suicidal. The observance of the United Nations Charter and international law, which are infringed upon time and time again, these are indispensable for peaceful coexistence among states. The UN must be defended from unilateralism, and at the same time it needs to be reformed into a more democratic organization, one that is closer to the problems, needs, and aspirations of peoples, capable of leading the international system toward peace, sustainable development, and respect for all the human rights of all. The reform of the Security Council, both in terms of its composition and working methods, is a task that should not be put off any longer. The strengthening of the General Assembly and the restoration of the functions that were usurped by the Security Council should guide our search for a more democratic and efficient organization. It is imperative to find a just and lasting solution to the Middle East conflict inexorably based on the exercise by the Palestinian people of its inalienable right to build its own state within the pre-1967 borders and with East Jerusalem as its capital. The Western Sahara situation requires an effort in conformity with United Nations resolutions to guarantee the Saharan people's self-determination and its and respect for its legitimate right to live in peace in its territory. Once again, we reiterate our confidence that the people of the Syrian Arab Republic will be able to settle its differences on its own when the foreign intervention aimed at promoting regime change ceases. NATO's attempts to expand its presence closer to the Russian borders, as well as the deployment of its anti-missile systems, are an incentive to the arms race and a threat to international peace and security. Likewise, we would like to express our opposition to the unjust and unilateral sanctions imposed against the Russian people, which are also harmful to Europe. Cuba, which has been a victim of state terrorism, reiterates its strong condemnation of all forms and manifestations of terrorism. Mr. President, the proclamation of Latin America and the Caribbean as a zone of peace, signed in Havana by the heads of state and government of our region in January 2014, on the occasion of the third summit of the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, CELAC, establishes principles and regulations for coexistence, cooperation, and respect among states, which are indispensable for the realization of the right to peace, and which are applicable to relations within our America and between it and the hemisphere and the world. We welcome 
the historic agreement between the government of Colombia and FARC-EP for the termination of the conflict and the construction of a stable and lasting peace, which was reached in Havana on 24th of August last. We will do our best, always at the request of the parties, to support its implementation. We will continue to support the people and the government of Venezuela. The civic military unity and the constitutional president, Nicolas Maduro, in the defense of its sovereignty and self-determination against the imperialist and oligarchic interference which attempts to destroy the Bolivarian and Chavista revolution to take over Venezuela's oil reserves and reverse the enormous social achievements that have been attained. We strongly condemn the parliamentary and judicial coup d'etat perpetrated in Brazil against President Dilma Rousseff and express our solidarity with her, the Brazilian people, the Workers' Party, and former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. We reiterate our conviction that the Puerto Rican people deserve to be free and independent after being submitted to colonial domination for more than a century. We will not renounce any of our revolutionary and anti-imperialist principles. The defense of independence, social justice, and people's rights, nor our commitment to cooperate with those in greatest need. Cuban cooperation workers who work in all continents will continue to make their contribution, including the 46,000 who are currently working in 61 countries struggling for the life and health of human beings. The medical parole program for Cuban health professionals, which the United States applies to pursue the political objective of hindering Cuba's medical cooperation and deprive the recipient countries and Cuba from valuable and highly qualified human resources is an unjust and shameful obstacle. Mr. President, a little more than a year has elapsed since the reestablishment of diplomatic relations between Cuba and the United States and the reopening of embassies in both countries. Some progress has been achieved in our bilateral relations, particularly in diplomatic relations, dialogue, and cooperation in areas of mutual interest. As has been evidenced by high-level visits, including a visit by President Barack Obama and the dozen of agreements signed on subjects that could render benefits to both countries and to the entire hemisphere. However, the fact is that the blockade is still in force. It continues to cause serious damage and hardships for the Cuban people and continues to hinder the functioning of our economy and its relations with other countries. Executive measures adopted by the government of the United States, although positive, are still insufficient. There are many recent examples of uh, the economic and financial damage caused by the blockade to Cuba and to third countries. As long as this continues to happen, we will continue to present to this assembly the draft resolution entitled Necessity of Ending the Economic, Commercial and Financial Embargo Imposed by the United States of America Against Cuba. We reiterate the Cuban government's willingness to continue developing a respectful dialogue with the government of the United States, knowing that there is still a long way ahead in order to move towards the normalization of relations, which means to build a new model of bilateral relations, a totally new one in our common history, which could never be forgotten. 
For this to be possible someday, it will be essential for the blockade to be lifted. Also, the territory illegally occupied by the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo against Cuba's will must be returned to our country. Mr. President, the Cuban people, even amidst the adverse conditions imposed by the current international situation and the persistence of the economic, commercial, and financial blockade imposed by the United States, continues to be involved in updating the economic and social model that it has decided to implement in a sovereign way in order to build a sovereign, independent, socialist, prosperous, and sustainable nation. Thank you.